Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and this is what I call my morning musings. Hey, I just want to say again how much I appreciate the, uh, the really, really nice emails I've received uh, in response to the series that I just finished on the question of how should we then live, ethics and eschatology. And I ask very often for you to send me your questions, send me your suggestions for topics. Well, one of the questions that I have received repeatedly is explain providence. Tell me how it works. And my response to that is, wow, I don't know if I can. <laughs> um, Providence is just an absolutely amazing topic. You know, we have those who are called deists, and an awful lot of amillennialists have been accused of being deists, and even some preterists have been accused of being deists. Well, a deist is someone who, according to the theory, and according to the accusations, believes that God set things in order, God set up the world, and then step back, and there's the world, let whatever happens, happens. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. I am absolutely not a deist. I am a firm believer in the providence of God. Explaining that in a precisely theological way, systematically theo theological way, is another matter entirely. I believe that we really have to admit at some point of time that we don't have all the answers. The Bible doesn't give us all of the answers to the questions that we might have about providence. But let's begin by asking the question, what is providence? What do we mean when we talk about the providence of God? Well, really, the word simply means God's provisions or God's provision in his scheme of redemption. When we come to this question, we are very often confronted with another question. Is providence, does God work in his providence in strictly and solely in a miraculous manner. You know, one of the questions that I've confronted as I talk with my charismatic friends is, well, if you don't believe in miracles, if you don't believe that God's still performing miracles today, then you can't believe that God is operative in the world today. No, that's a non sequitur. There's no logical connection in those statements. Let me illustrate. We have example after example after example in Scripture in which God operated behind the scenes, as it were, but God was very much at work. We see his hand, especially in retrospect, and especially as we read the text, but there is no miracle, miracle involved. Take, for instance, the story of Esther. Now, anyone familiar with the story of Esther knows that the word God and Yahweh does not appear anywhere in the story. It's just not there. Of course, the first letter of the lines in the Hebrew text began with the letter, letters in the name of Yahweh over and over and over again. Now, what that tells us is that although we have an incredible story of providence, there is no miracle involved. We have the story of the king who is displeased with his queen, kicks her out of court, and begins a search for another queen. Here is this young Jewish who happens to be a gorgeous young woman. She is chosen, taken to court. The king falls in love with her. We have the evil 
enemy of God's people, the Jews, conspiring to destroy them. And we have the story of Vashti, or excuse me, of Esther, with her courage, with her faith, praying to the Lord. And yet, in the midst of all that, her fear of approaching the king without being called into his presence. After all, this could, this could mean death. And yet, her uncle telling her, well, you can choose to go or not to go. If you don't go, then God will raise up or someone will be raised up. But who knows? But what you were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. You were brought, you see, there's, there's God at work. Miracle? No miracle involved. It was, quote, natural that she was born. It was, quote, natural that she was raised. It was, quote, natural that she was a beautiful young woman. See, all of these events are there. And, and Mordecai, her uncle, very clearly expresses that God is at work here. Who knows but what you were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. She approaches the king. He accepts her. A decree is signed. Haman is destroyed. The Jews are saved. The kingdom is preserved. Where's the miracle? You read through the entire story. There is no miracle involved. Was God providing for his people? Indubitably. Was God providing for Esther? Undoubtedly. Was God bringing someone to the kingdom for such a time as this? Without a doubt. Now, we can see all of that perfectly in the record as we read it in retrospect. Mordecai had the faith to see it, had, had the faith to know that God was in charge. But again, no miracle involved. I believe that when it comes to the providence of God, we have to believe, be very firm believers in God's promises. In the next segment, we will look at God's promise and promises that demand his involvement in history in ways perhaps that we do not understand, in ways perhaps that we may never understand, except in hindsight. In the meantime, I freely confess to you my ignorance of understanding all of the marvels of the providence of God. But I freely also affirm my unequivocal belief and trust in the providence of God. Hey, thanks for joining me for today's Morning Musings. We'll see you on the flip side.